Natalia Pasternak is best known in her home country, Brazil. Here in Geneva, we are surrounded by some of the world's leading scientists, Nobel Prize winners. I had to sacrifice my life and let the children go with their father to the refugee camp, then made sure that I moved with the students to come to Juba. Hello and welcome to the Global Health Matters podcast. I'm your host, Gary Aslanian. Today you'll be hearing from three renowned communicators of science who work to inform, educate, and inspire the public about health issues. They also work hard to debunk dangerous science myths. First, we will hear from microbiologist Natalia Pasternak, who has become one of the leading communicators of science in Brazil and internationally. Natalia will be followed by Imogen Folks, who reflects upon her experiences reporting during the COVID-19 pandemic as a journalist with the BBC based in Geneva. And we will end with filmmaker Sonia Lohman, who highlights the value of going beyond the facts and uncovering the truth that can be found in a single human story. Welcome to Hard Talk on the BBC World Service with me, Stephen Sacker. Natalia Pasternak is best known in her home country, Brazil. As you just heard, Natalia Pasternak is no stranger to the media. Given her background as a scientist, her experience and passion have made her trusted voice featured in numerous television broadcasts newspapers and magazines in Brazil and overseas. Natalia also established the Instituto Gestão de Ciência in 2018 to promote critical thinking and public policies based on scientific evidence. Welcome to the podcast, Natalia. Thank you for joining me from Sao Paulo today. Natalia, you have a very illustrative career as a scientist and your journey from lab bench to TV studio started in a very personal way. Maybe you could share this story with our audience. Sure, it, it was really unexpected. I, I, I was really a, a bench scientist. So I did my PhD and my postdoc studies in uh, 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 studying bacterial genetics in a laboratory. I used to walk at the bench, studying bacteria, studying genetics. That was my walk. And uh, when I took some time away from the lab, when my daughter was born, I, I really, uh, I saw myself in a whole different situation. And all of a sudden, I was taken into this whole other bubble that was the bubble of motherhood. And I was talking to a whole, a lot of other parents and especially mothers. And we had this discussion groups on WhatsApp. And of course, we discussed things about babies and school and education. And, and suddenly I realized that everything I knew about science was not obvious to everyone. And the things that were being discussed in these mothers groups were so anti-scientific. It was so full of pseudoscience and very strange beliefs. And I was very quiet at the group because I really wanted them to like me. I became very quiet, but all of a sudden they started to question vaccinations. And I then realized that I had to speak up. I was a scientist, and this was a very, very serious issue. These women were considering not vaccinating their children because they were afraid. They really believed the anti-vaccine movement that said that vaccines cause autism or any, any kind of collateral problems in babies and children, and they were afraid of vaccinating their children. So I had to speak up, and I did. And I got excited and I said, wow, this works. They, they, they are talking to me. They are interacting. They, they, and, they, and they believe me when I say that vaccines are safe and effective and there's nothing to be afraid of. So I said, wow, this thing of communicating science really works. 
So I got extra excited and then I started to talk about alternative medicine and homeopathy and acupuncture and how nothing of that sort works and they blocked me. Uh, so uh, then I realized it wasn't that easy after all. Talking about science to non-specialists, to lay people, is not that easy. And then I realized that if I was going to do science communication, I, I had to learn how to do it. It's not something that you just decide, okay, I'm going to have a blog right now. It's something that you, you need practice, you need training. Uh, otherwise, you, you're just going to hit a wall like I did. So through that humbling experience, through that WhatsApp group, um, you ended up successfully establishing this NGO, uh, which is Instituto Questão de Ciência in Brazil, which means an Institute of Question of Science. And you got some support and training. Uh, so what kind of support did you get or what kind of training you got? I got support from international organizations that already worked with science communication and advocacy, and they had a lot of experience doing that. So I had a lot of help from the Center for Inquiry in the US and the Good Thinking Society in the UK. And they really helped me format the way I wanted my institute to be in Brazil. And the way that we decided to do it was to have an NGO really focused on the promotion of scientific-based public policies. This is what we wanted from the start. We wanted to have uh, two major roles. One, to talk directly to the public, to the lay public about science, about scientific method, how science works, and make science available to the public in a way that they could understand it in a way that it would be easy to reach. And for this, so we launched a magazine together with the Institute. The magazine is also called A Question of Science and it's online, it's free. And we write for the lay people. So we write in a very, uh, uh, in a very simple language that anyone without any scientific background can follow. And on the other hand, we work a lot with science advocacy. So we reach out to parliament members and government members to help them formulate public policies that are science-based. So we make ourselves available. If they want, for instance, they want to formulate a public policy, a law or a regulation about the use of embryonic stem cells in research, but they don't know where to start. So we can help them start get started. We can help them understand what science says about that particular issue. Uh, and so we've been trying to work with these two fronts, one with the public and one with government and parliament members. On your website, um, you already have a statement that was quite interesting. It said science is much more than a body of knowledge or a community of men and women in lab coats. It is a special way of thinking and looking at the world, an attitude at the same time critical and constructive in the face of the claims of others and own beliefs. How do you promote this um, notion and, and why do you think it's so important? We think it's important to promote what we call a scientific attitude. I think this is much more important than really understanding all concepts about science. But if you understand how science works and you develop a scientific attitude towards the world, you are going to be a skeptic. And that's our major goal, uh, a healthy skepticism. Uh, a skeptic is not the one who denies reality or denies everything. That would be a denialist. A skeptic is the one who questions and says, okay, uh, you claim that this is true. I want to see the evidence and I want to understand the evidence behind it. So this is what we go for. We want people to be educated, to think scientifically and to adopt a skeptic attitude saying, okay, show me the evidence and then maybe I'll believe you. My, my job is to make you question even me. I, I am not to be trusted. Science is to be trusted. Evidence is to be trusted, not people. Natalia, you're very passionate about scientists having this societal responsibility and for science communication to be 
really part of the scientist's career or researcher's career or or be a, a career on its own. How do you think this can be done? Uh, we have many listeners from all around the world and, and they would really um, benefit from your views on this and, and, and how we can approach that. Well, especially here in Brazil, Gary, uh, science communication is actually very frowned upon from inside the academia. People think that you're wasting your time, that science communication is just a hobby. Let the young people do it. It's not a real profession. And you should be really working with science and working at the laboratory. That's what counts, producing papers and talking to your peers. And I think the pandemic hits us in the face with that when we realize that without science communication, there can be no science. Science is not going to be valued without good science communication. And if we, inside the academia, if we don't value science communication as a career on its own, as a profession, just as good as any other, we won't have it done professionally. So in Brazil, what happens is that people who embrace science communication, they usually do it as a hobby. I think science communication in Brazil is still very young and needs to be institutionalized. It must be taken into the universities and the research institutes as a career, as a career on its own, so that it can be done professionally. And people who want to do, who want to, to go to science communication can get proper training to do that. Because as I said, in my experience with the WhatsApp mom group, uh, it, it's not obvious. It's not intuitive. You have to learn how to do it. There are lots of techniques on how to speak to the public. And, and this has to be learned, just like any other profession. So I guess, especially in time of the pandemic, uh, many scientists uh, were increasingly asked to have a voice. People were asking them to speak to different media, etc. And I've seen you uh, being front and center on a lot of the networks in Brazil, uh, Globo or Cultura, and other mainly watched by almost uh, most of the population. Um, you mentioned briefly that you need to learn some of these tricks and how to communicate. And, and how do you think scientists can be better equipped with these skills, even if they have not really gone through formal training? I think the most important thing is that even if they are not going to pursue uh, science communication careers, every scientist must have at least uh, a minor training on how to speak to the different publics, how to speak to the lay public, how to speak to journalists, how to speak to politicians, to uh, to, to all kinds of of stakeholders, to industry, because uh, they are they are going to have to do it uh, in some way or another during their scientific career. They are going to have to speak to journalists or to politicians in, uh, in one way or another. So they have to learn at least basic skills on how to do it. I used to teach a course here at the University of Sao Paulo for biomedical grad students, but what I wanted to give them, so they, they, they spent one semester with me learning basic skills of communication so that they will be able to talk to journalists and lay public and politicians in their scientific careers. They are still going to be scientists, but they have to learn how to speak to different publics. And there are lots of uh, easy ways to do it. So uh, mainly... Uh, learning how to to make people understand some basic concepts of science, for instance, that uh, correlation is different from causation and that animal models don't really translate into human models when we're talking about medications. So they're very basic stuff that for scientists are obvious, but for the lay public, they're not. They have to be explained. And there is a, a very easy way to explain that. I mean, uh, we, we don't have, we shouldn't view the public as incapable of understanding science because that's just not true. Everyone is perfectly capable of understanding scientific principles and concepts, even if they don't understand all the technology involved. And this is what we have, we want to teach teach our scientists how to do. Social media can never have the same uh, uh, 
it, it can never be as trust as trustworthy as a peer review process, uh, a vehicle with an editorial board. It just can't because it's no man's land. Anyone can write anything on social media. It's a tool. And I'm not saying it's a bad tool, as any tool is neutral. It can be used for the good or for the bad. It depends on how you use it. So we have to learn to make good use of social media. Uh, I tend to never use social media to really um, produce uh to, to produce a text or or or, or to really produce content. Uh, I like my content to be either peer reviewed in in uh, or but of course I, I don't write that many scientific articles because I, I I produce content for for communication for the general media. But I like my content to be reviewed by at least an editorial board. So I write for general newspapers and magazines and vehicles that have accountability in the society. They are responsible for what they publish. For listeners in other countries or our, our audience who might be interested in replicating or starting a similar institute in their countries, do you have any advice uh, you could share with them? Sure. Ask for help. Don't start from scratch. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are many organizations in the world who will be willing to help you just as they help me. I would be willing to help anyone who wants to, st to start a similar organization now that I have more experience. Uh, and be part of this international skeptic and science communication community. I think this Congress that we put together with the Aspen Institute in New York was a great starter because we brought together people from different countries and different origins and different backgrounds. Reach out to this community. We exist and it's not that difficult to find us. I guarantee there's a lot of people willing to help. Obrigado, Natalia, for this great conversation and your insights uh, into this important topic. You're most welcome, and I hope I helped with this topic and we'll hope to see it growing in the world. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to this very special extra edition of our podcast, Inside Geneva. Now That's the voice of my next guest, Imogen Folks. She's been the BBC correspondent in Geneva since 2004. She has reported on a variety of humanitarian crises and post-conflict situations in places like Bosnia, Kosovo, and Haiti. Imogen tackles pressing topics, including health, in her podcast called Inside Geneva. Imogen, welcome to the show from here in Geneva. I'd like to start by asking whether there was anything in your early childhood or in your early years that really informed and shaped your career. My dad said that my first question was why. My first word was why. Um, I think I was just always curious. I always watched the news from very young. And I mean, I come from a parents who were teachers um, and was maybe half expected to do that as well. So I surprised them by saying, nope, 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 it's going to be the media. Um, but they were also, my family was also very curious about current affairs. So I guess that's probably it. When you do your reporting, um, how do you get a scientific evidence and how do you ensure that sort of that evidence is balanced and, and it comes from different perspectives or different countries. How do you go about that, Imogen? There, there's two questions there, aren't there? There's, there's evidence, hard facts, statistics, which we're always looking, reporting from the United Nations. You have one report after another, which says X number of people, X number of cases. You do have to dig a bit deeper to find out their methodology, how they got there, uh, data. How old is it? You'd be shocked sometimes. Maybe some of the data that gets pushed out to us is, you know, it's only two or three years old. To be fair, some of this data is difficult to gather. Um, but there are also then opinions. Also on questions of science, we see that all the time with, with, with the COVID-19 pandemic, that there are the number of cases, we're fairly sure what they are. 
probably higher than is actually recorded, but still we've got a reasonable picture. How we interpret that data, that's a different thing. And different people will interpret it in different ways, depending on what their job is. There are epidemiologists and then there are um, government leaders. Right, right. Imogen, what's been your experience in communicating science during COVID-19 pandemic? There were times when it felt like an infodemic is as great of a threat as the pandemic. I think it is really challenging. Yeah. And I mean, when I started in Geneva all those years ago, it was at the tail end of SARS. And we had swine flu and we had Ebola and then we had COVID-19. And I think... I guess I had some experience on reporting uh, public health emergencies. But with COVID-19, what was fascinating but concerning to compare it with SARS was that because the whole social media available of all sorts of information, false and correct, had exploded between 2004 and 2020, everybody wanted answers immediately. And I'm sitting there in Geneva reporting to the world on what the World Health Organization is saying. And and the answer was actually, we don't know yet. And to try and explain in a responsible way that actually science takes time. And people want immediate answers. It's quite hard as a journalist. You want to be able to give them answers. You want to be able to give them the information. But I think you do, you are confronted with the enormous public responsibility you have as a journalist reporting on a global health risk issue like that. From your experience, what are some of the frustrations or challenges in dealing with scientists when you're trying to report to the public? I have to say, sometimes with this pandemic, um, it has been a little bit frustrating to hear again and again, look at the case numbers, look at this, look at that. Oh my goodness, this is this is this is really terrible. Um, when you know the entire planet is locked down and millions of people were losing their livelihoods and millions of children were not going to school, and I. Th- sometimes felt, not just as a journalist, but as a kind of ordinary citizen, that the epidemiologists, in their way of communicating, made people feel a little bit as if they were dots on a graph rather than people. And they... I can't. I mean, I can't tell you the 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 dozens of times I've heard epidemiologists praise New Zealand to the skies. Oh, well, that was brilliant. They just locked down completely. Now, if you ask my cousin, who hasn't been able to leave the country for you know well over a year and a half and see his family back in the UK, he's not you know he's not entirely enamoured of that policy. And there was also, it seemed to me, little understanding that. What, why would you, why would you, to say Europeans praise New Zealand when you, if you thought about it at all, you would know perfectly well it's just not that policy is not going to be possible. And I think this, this was a, a real split between. I'm not talking about governments which kind of tried to ignore the pandemic. We know who they are, you know, the United States for a while, uh, Brazil, maybe some even argue the United Kingdom, but perfectly well-meaning governments who tried to do their best. Um, and, it was, oh, you know, you, you know, you need to do more, you need to do more. I do think this, I think there actually there needs to be a real, a real analysis from among the scientific community of how of how they approached it too. If we were to put aside um, you know, this particular situation with COVID for the last year and a half and look at other um, health issues and and communication of those health issues, um, do you have any advice on that? For a lot of our listeners are in low and middle income countries, they're working their particular area for research and and they want to um, better communicate what they're 
work is about and how are they improving the health of 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 the people in their country uh, how what would you be your advice to them well i mean maybe target uh journalists who work on public health issues get their emails say mm -hmm. in the first paragraph say i've got this great story for you this is what it is in the first paragraph um i think It, it hopefully we're moving to post pandemic and obviously let's let, let's not talk about covid um and i agree with you but it's so hard that's <laughs> what everybody talks about <laughs> but what i would say is maybe emerging from this i think the entire planet's attention has been really focused on public health global health and, and the who has done a brilliant job of explaining the inequities of public health. So I think there are more listening ears out there now for some of these issues. I mean, you know, we, we, we've had a report, a joint report from the World Food Program, UNICEF and the World Health Organization about global hunger and the amount of children on the planet who are malnourished. These are things which absolutely deserve media attention. The work being done to, to, to counter that you know, should get more attention. One more last maybe piece of advice that you would give to scientists to gain that public trust or effectively uh, do the communication of science to the society. Any two or three last pieces of advice? To, to, to scientists? Yes. Um, go home, phone your friends and your family and ask them what they want to know before telling them what you think they should know. All of what we had were left behind. We only secured lives of people. I had two things to decide on. I had a family, which is my biological family, and I had a family which was the students. But I had to sacrifice my life and let the children go with the father to the refugee camp, then made sure that I moved with the students to come to Chuba. That was an excerpt from a film by my next guest, Sonia Lohman. Sonia is a senior communication specialist for International Medical Corps. She is also a writer and documentary filmmaker of features such as Black Boys and Teach Us All. Her most recent short film, Born and Grace, is about midwives in conflict-ridden South Sudan. This film won the Grand Prix in the Nurse and Midwife category at the World Health Organization's Health for All Film Festival in 2020. In 2021, Sonia served as a member of the film festival's jury panel. Sonia, thank you for joining me from Los Angeles today. You've had a very diverse career, from studying international relations, to transitioning into humanitarian work and now becoming a recognized filmmaker. Could you maybe share with us where your story started? Yeah, probably the biggest one would relate to, you know, the decision to become a filmmaker um, and, you know, growing up in L.A. and actually having you know, a father that was a writer, um, for a newspaper, but he covered movies. <laughs> so we, you know, movies were a very big part of my upbringing, um, Hollywood, you know, go to movie premieres and things like that. And I was actually very turned off by this industry. So I wanted to get as far away from LA as possible and as far away from movies as possible. And I wanted to go change the world and help the world and, you know, do all this, um, really important work. And, But what was interesting is the more I traveled around the world, the more I've met, you know, the more I've started to realize the power of storytelling um, in the film industry and how far Hollywood has reached around the world. And so it was just very eye-opening to me to see that 
I could, you know, I could go somewhere where there was no running water or electricity and somehow they knew the TV show Friends and could quote, you know, <laughs> like these episodes and we could find that common ground and this universal language. Um, so the more and more I began to recognize like just how far reaching it is, how powerful it is, the more I found myself kind of questioning how I... um you know, how I wanted to affect change. And I was living in DC and I was working for a small NGO and it, you know, and the work is very important, but I was writing papers that I was like, you know, probably five people are going to read this paper. It was so highly specialized and it was this niche kind of thing. And, um, I started really asking myself, you know, like, how do I reach more people and realizing that actually, wait, you know, I could probably reach more people if I um, became a filmmaker in a way. And so that was really when I said, I want to, you know, I want to try to create um, stories that, that can help, you know, represent the, not only the issues I care about, but also, um, create help create like a vision for where we're going so you've become a filmmaker filmmaker of your own on your own when you choose uh, topics for the films uh for example the one uh war and grace uh which won the grand prix at the last year's who uh film uh festival for health for all how do you choose these stories? I'm working for for International Medical Corps, but I really w I've always had this kind of question is like, you know, how do we communicate what we're doing in a way that connect more with people emotionally? And so for War and Grace, you know, we're dealing with an issue. We're dealing with a country, South Sudan, that's just, you know, you could name 50 devastating statistics right now, like off the top of your head about this, you know, war torn country that's, that's been through decades of civil war and, you know, just massive displacement and hunger and gender-based violence and disease and you name it. And it's just incomprehensible. And then, you know, the, the reproductive health issue there, you know, for women, um, the maternal health, it has, along with Afghanistan, the highest maternal mortality in the world. And again, how do you feel that? How do you connect with that? It's without feeling totally like you're going to just shut down emotionally because it's so much. So I wanted to create something that was, you know, character driven where, where it felt more like you were watching a film. It felt more like you could really connect with this person. Um, and, in order to talk about these larger issues. And that's how, you know, we really zeroed in on Grace, the protagonist of the film, who's in and of herself, just this incredibly, I mean, you couldn't even write a more <laughs> heroic character. This woman devotes every, you know, second of her life to her cause and has sat, made many personal sacrifices and is you know, running this midwife, midwifery school in South Sudan. And, and they're like, literally this tiny beacon of hope and um you know these these midwives are from all over the country trying um against these just you know again massive massive challenges but here are these people that are that are trying and so we just kind of approached the, the idea I, I pitched it to my organization um and said you know i really want to do it in a very character driven way and so so that's how we chose it we kind of chose it was very unique We'd never done something like that obviously like more of a 22 minute longer form film that 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 felt like something more character driven um i never went to film school i never took a film class um but it was an experiment and it seemed to work pretty well <laughs> so so going back to this festival uh the uh, health for all that who puts together this year 2021 you were on the jury and you were part of the group that assessed the films could you share with us how um you felt and which of them really had the most impact on you yeah it was it was really incredible to be a juror actually because i got to see such a diverse get the collection of films um and learn about new topics myself through this way um 
I think the thing that was sort of the strongest takeaway for me was again, kind of just how compelling film is because there also were a number of films that were on issues I already knew a lot about and from an academic standpoint, but to see it presented in a film very emotionally or maybe with a character or something like that had such a, just such a profound effect, I think. And one example was um, a short film on female genital mutilation, um, which is a topic that I know about and have studied about, have read about, have, you know, and have had obviously emotions about, you know, um, but it's a, again, an issue that you're like, I can't even like fathom this and, or what to do about it. It's so horrifying. And, you know, and so there was a short film. It was like probably two minutes about female genital mutilation, but it was done with a character, mm-hmm. with a young girl and just one person um, and her experience with this and her mother. And it was done in a very dramatic way. And I remember just sitting there being very sort of stunned because here's an issue that I've known about for a couple, you know, however many years, over a decade, if not more. This was a film with characters and this two minute film like had more of an impact on me than all the reports and articles and, you know, that I've read and the statistics that I've seen. So it stays with you so much longer than I think a lot of things that you could read are. So it was really wonderful to be part of this and to see all this talent from around the world, um, these different ways of talking about issues that are both things we've known about and then, you know, things we don't know about. Many of the films in the festival were in, in this year were really touching upon people who are really suffering from COVID or COVID related issues. And, and, and obviously it's, it's clear in 2021 that that's a huge issue when it comes to health in many countries. Uh, do you think a film as a medium, um, has value beyond communication and also helps in kind of healing and hope for um, those who produce and contribute to the film, but also to the audience? Yeah, I mean, I actually often think about filmmaking as healing work. I do think it's incredibly healing, especially the, you know, the right film. I mean, especially if it's inspiring and and it reminds us of our shared humanity and it reminds us that we're not alone. And, um, you know, I think it can, I think we all want to turn to film for, for comfort a lot of times, you know, we look at it for entertainment, but sometimes it's because we want emotional catharsis, you know, to cry or to, to be inspired and to be, um, you know, to see somebody's story that, that makes us want to be better and things like that. So I think, you know, a lot of the beautiful messages that came out of, you know, for COVID-19 were related to, to our togetherness and our shared humanity and, very, it's very hopeful and inspiring to see that, especially at a time when we were very isolated and alone and scared. Um, and, and I think that should be the main purpose of film is like reminding of us of our shared humanity, you know? And I think that is very, very healing. Um, and I think it can give us, a, like I sort of said earlier, a vision of what is possible and, and what could be, not only documenting kind of the world as it is, but really showing us the way forward. In today's show, we cross the globe, and we hope that wherever you may be listening from, the experiences and insights shared by Natalia, Imogen, and Sonia will have given you a new way of approaching communication of research and science in your context. Now more than ever, there is a need for truthful, easily digestible, and hope-filled content as we navigate a post-pandemic reality and continue tackling many other public health challenges. On behalf of the Global Health Matters podcast, we want to thank you for listening to this episode. As always, We would like to hear from you, our listeners. Engage with us either on social media or send us an email. To remind you, more information on our guests, their work, and today's show notes are available on the podcast webpage. 
Global Health Matters is produced by TDR, the special program for research and training in tropical diseases. Gary Aslanian, Lindy Van Niekerk and Maki Kitamura are the content producers and Obadiah George is the technical producer. This podcast was also made possible with the support of Chris Coase, Elisabetta Desi and Isa Suder Dayao. The goal of Global Health Matters is to provide a forum for sharing perspectives on key issues affecting global health research. Send us your comments and suggestions to tdrpod at who.int and be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.